While the American Revolution was being fought, right here in South Africa, fierce battle between the Zulus and the Dutch took place. We'll visit the Kaklov Game Reserve, go to an actual Zulu village, and cook up some original South African dishes. Join me for a wild taste of history, right here in South Africa. The Guan Natal region is full of history and we are celebrating the cuisine of South Africa, which is a really fantastic melting pot of different cultures. And the recipe we're making are thousands of years old. Since I know nothing about Zulu cooking, Princess is going to enlighten me. First, what are we making? We are making a Zulu dumpling and some chicken. The Zulu dumpling is called Itombolo. It's chicken and dumpling. So we mix the salt, the yeast, mm -hmm. Then some sugar, mm -hmm. we mix. Nicely mixed nicely under the combined, yes. combined under flour, mm -hmm. gotcha. And then add some water. Mm -hmm. You mix with the water. This recipe has been here for thousands. That's My grandmother taught me. It's a very <laughs> special recipe. So is that something you eat every day or on a holiday? No, not every day, like on special occasions. Uh -huh. When the father comes home, like from work on Fridays or a month end, you make this special dinner for him. So it's, like, so it's like a Sunday meal, right? Yes, Kinda like a Sunday meal. Like... He needs to feel special when, when, when he's around. <laughs> he needs to feel that, yeah. So you're just going to work this uh, into mm. a smooth dough, correct? Yeah, it's a smooth dough. I'm working it to make sure that everything is together and the dough will rise for the whole family to have, even the neighbors. So how long do you let it sit up before you put it in the pot? An hour. We have a pot on the fire in a duchy. Can you please get the pot for me? Gosh, I don't speak Zulu, but now I'm learning. <laughs> well, let me go get it for you. All right. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Now we're going to, we're going to put the chicken first and the Zulu dumpling, it don't boil. Then we're going to add some salt. And then add amanzi, that's water. Okay, chef, we have many things to do today. So while the chicken and the tombolo is boiling, mm -hmm. we're going to make a sauce. Okay. So the sauce is called tomatoes. What's the name of this in your tongue? It's called ushatin. In English, you say shiba. Shiba. Ushatin yeah. or shiba in English? It's tomatoes, onions, and some garlic. That sounds very good. We're going to put the oil in a hot pot. All right. And please bring me the ingredients. Absolutely. We're going to put the onions and garlic first. First to sweat it out, gotcha. yeah. But no color, you make no color, it's just sweating it, right? Mm. Gotcha. I want to make color with the curry. Can I please have some oil, chef? Here we go. Thank you. So the onions must be cooked until it's golden brown. Tomatoes first. Here we go. Mm. Then add some salt. Sulo huevos ranchero. Mm. <laughs> Perfect. It's almost done now, you see. It's easy to cook and it's fast. Can you now oh. see the difference? Oh, man. <laughs> Not too many crazy ingredients. Yeah. That's what makes it beautiful. Mm. It's really beautiful. What do we make next? The dishes to go with the chicken and dumpling. Uh -huh. We've got amadumbe, amadumbe and then we've got uputu. Yeah, but Dumbe, ironically, now popular also in the United States, you know. Mm -hmm. This is a family of a sweet potato type, like. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. And, and uh, the mice is kind of like what? Like, like a porridge? Like a pup. Like a pup. But it's dry. It's more, it's more dry. All right. So what so do you need me to do? Here we've got boiling water. Okay. I'm going to add some salt. I'm going to add mealy meal. Let me have it. Careful, it's hot. Must cover the pot. Yeah, hold it. Don't burn yourself. So next is the anadombe, right? Amadumbe. So what we got to so do? I'm going to put amadumbe in the pot. Yeah. Can you please help me, chef? Yeah. All in there? Yes. All right. Now Beautiful. I need to stay the uputu. Yep. Uputu. So princess, so you know, you know, the Italians in, so they invented polenta. While mm. you here 
2,000 years ago mm. already made it. See? Yes, Oputo. Oputo, you got some of them? Yeah. From now on, Oputo it is. Never mind mm. Polenda. Yeah. <laughs> this Oputo, the Zulus, they eat it almost every day. So, Princess, I was in New Mexico not mm. long ago and cooking with the Native Americans. Thousand years of history as well. Mm. And you, would you believe it? Their favorite dish is exactly it's, what we're making mm, here. It's very So it's nice. very interesting how the world travels in yeah. the culinary circles, no? They make me blue cornmeal instead mm. of uh, regular white cornmeal. Amazing. I like it too. It's very nice. You can have it with milk. Yeah, well, that's what they do. Yeah. Actually, they call it breakfast of champion. They use mm. that with some honey and some dried plums. Yeah. It's really beautiful, though. Thank you. Here we go. Oh. Now that you have the side dishes ready and the chicken is boiling, we're going to do your favorite chef. The warthog. The How best. do you know it's my favorite already? The word is out, huh? Yeah. Matter of fact, you know, yesterday I saw so many warthogs and you guess every time they saw me, they went off. Because then I was looking for them. <laughs> In Africa, game reserves provide essential protection for wildlife, helping to ensure the survival of the continent's remarkable animals. The Karkloop Safari Spa is a small reserve near Durban spanning over 8,500 acres of pristine countryside with four microclimates. We came into this area and we saw this most magnificent valley that's got something very, very special about it. The Karkloof Falls, second highest in the province with 106 meters high, Karkloof River, and it's pristine and indigenous forest surrounded by cliffs. The game viewing here is just unbelievable. You have the buffalo in the background and zebra, you have hippo down there. You have this big bull down here just trying to find himself a nice wallow in the mud, splashing into the road. Oops. Disease free buffalo and rhinoceros are part of what we would consider rare animal species. When the English took over from the Dutch settlers in the early 19th century, the Dutch referred to what is known as the white rhino as the weight rhinoster, weight as in broad. And the English came and thought, while white, while the other one must be black. The black rhino, it's got a pointed mouth and it's a browser, it eats leaves. It was brought off the endangered species list, but currently it's, it's heading there very quickly. And it needs to have small reserves that are prepared to run the risk and to try and save the rhino. And their horn is valuable in the Asian market and they poached for that. And unfortunately they, they kill the animals in order to get those horns. It's a perfect area for a rhino reserve. You know, you've got this full spectrum of species here. My favourite is being able to work with buffalo, being able to work with such a, a feared animal and to actually see the, the softer side of the animal and you know, to actually see that they, they can be worked with. The giraffes are very charismatic. You know, they get so used to people and they kind of look down at you and Oh, you know, what are you doing today? And they breed so well that we have to sell giraffe every so often. So much for lunch. Okay, now, Chef, I'm going to make you a water kebabs, your favorite. My favorite, you got it? Yes. Yeah. Here's your water. Fantastic. <laughs> oh, man. Look, I've got a beauty. It's a very, very sharp answer. What do people, they call them? Yeah, we call them Ushavu, Eva. It's very dangerous. Common here? Yes, they're very common. They grow everywhere, in a bush field. In the bush? Yeah. And what's the name of Sulu? It's Ushavu. 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 Yeah. I'm thinking Sulu by the time this is finished. Ushavu. <laughs> okay, let me yeah. help you. Mm. So basically, we're just going to cut some nice, okay. lean, lean warthog meat. Yeah. That we saw earlier. Then and just kind of screw it mm. on the... In uh, the Ushavu. And the Oslavo. Mm. Uh -huh. So how many pieces put there? Two or three? You can put uh, three. Right. Three for the big the one. Okay. Yeah, yeah, two for the big one. Here we go. We made some ahead of time already. What? We are now putting this oh. in an open fire. Can you smell? Yeah. Good smell. So all we got to do is let them cook a little bit, turn mm. them over once. Yeah. They look so fantastic. Tell me what we got. We've got chicken in kuku, itombola, the root dumpling, upoto, and we have Sheba and some um, Amadumbe. And then your favorite, your water <laughs> kebabs. So, so now we're going to taste 
our tomorrow. And, and what's interesting, what you told me, is that when you eat it in a Sulu style, you just bake it by hand. Yeah, you don't use a fork or knife, you just... Yeah. just so we do it in Sulu style, okay, yeah. let me try. Mmm, fantastic, and chicken. Mmm. Can I taste? Mmm-hmm. <laughs> Words cannot describe it, I'll tell you mm. what, you are the best. <laughs> The Drakensberg is the highest mountain range in South Africa. Here, among the beautiful valleys and majestic stone outcroppings, live the sand people. The sand people are hunter-gatherers, dating as far back as the Stone Age, some 5,000 years ago. And they speak in their languages. While they lived here in these caves, they drew scenes from their existence. There are over 35,000 individual paintings in 600 locations from the sand people. These cave drawings, while primitive, were like the newspapers of their time, providing information about good hunting areas, dangers to avoid, and tribal experiences. The sand other people, they were peaceful. They don't want to fight with the other people. They decided it's better, they took out their important things, moved away, they won't come back. As the Zulu tribes, known for their fierce warriors, migrated southward from Central Africa in search of fertile land, they encountered and wiped out the gentle sand people. Shaka, king of the Zulus, united the various Zulu tribes to fierce intimidation. Ah! He succeeded in creating a nation so feared that other tribes wouldn't consider challenging it. You may have never seen a big bird like that, trust me. It's an ostrich, which is a very popular dish down here in South Africa and many other parts of the world. And here is Christine, the head chef of the Cutlof Spa, who's going to help me make, what is it? Stew. African? Ostrich stew, yeah. I was intrigued with it to see that only, it's only really meat on the legs and nothing else is really, it's just carcass. Yes, the rest of the carcass we can't really use. Some people use the bones to make a stock, stock. or a, uh, or a sauce. That's a little more understandable in this form. <laughs> <laughs> yes, even though it's a bird, people often think it's a, it's a white meat, but it's actually a red meat. And it's also very healthy for you because it's very lean um, and it's high in, in iron. But it's also not gamey, which is interesting. It reminds me mostly, I could think uh, like beef almost yes, tastes the yeah. same, right? Like a grass-fed grass beef. beef. Exactly. The dish we make, in, how do you call it? A poiti in, 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 yes. in Afrikaans. A poiki means a small pot, a really. Pot, so. yeah. But we, if we talk about a poiki, we talk about the dish, the finished product of the dish. You know, I've been here for a couple of days and uh, my ears, uh, I, I pick up a lot of words. So I didn't realize how much German is in integrated into your African dialects. It's interesting. The Afrikaner came from a whole lot of uh, cultures. Um, it started way back in, in the 1600s yeah, the Dutch. with the Dutch when they came to South Africa. Uh, our language is very similar to the Dutch language, um, but we also have German settlers. We also have the French Huguenots that came to South Africa um, and also the Malayan slaves that came to South Africa and also, of course, the locals, the Zulus. Uh, from this area and all those languages made up our language of today. There's so many culinary cultures in here, which is just everywhere you look, there's something else come looking at you. So this dish sounds very intriguing, so let's get started. Sure. Right. So we've got the ostrich already cubed. Uh, I just made it like nice chunks mm -hmm. so that it can cook uh, fairly quickly. On the fire, mm -hmm. we have the pot already hot. We're going to add the oil, small batches, <laughs> and then just keep on stirring. To so that it browns all the way around nicely. It's not a lot of fat in the ostrich meat itself, so it looks like a little, lot of oil, but it will cook into the meat into the, yeah. and absorb it. Okay. So next thing, we're going to do some onions and some garlic. So just a, it doesn't really matter how you chop it. Just rough a, rough, chop, yeah, because... a rough chop, because you just need the flavor of the onion. Gotcha. So it caramelize nicely. And then comes the garlic and then the veg, right? Yes. So Walter, we're going to add some water. Mm -hmm. And then yeah. just let it uh, gently simmer. With the lid. With the lid. MIT, with the lid. You know, I've been cooking a dachi for a long time, but I've never been this close to the origin of a dachi than right here. <laughs> so the dachi really comes from the Dutch, right? Early on. Yes.
The Dutch East India Company was started in 1602 to manage the monopoly the Dutch enjoyed in growing spices in Indonesia, which were then shipped back to Europe, sailing around the Cape of Good Hope, the southernmost tip of Africa. In 1652, the Dutch East India Company decided to create a colony here in South Africa. A new form of Dutch immigrant was born, known as the Voortrekkers or the Traveling Farmers. And that's when the Great Trek started. Entire villages of families traversed the open plains of central South Africa for decades, grazing their livestock, working the land, and encountering very few natives. As the war traders migrated, they took these pots that were hanging on their wagon to cook their meals. They called them paddy. We call them Dutch pots. Why? Because they came from Dutch settlers, and they were very popular with the early American settlers. And that's why I cook with them on the show every day. The fur trackers actually kept moving um, until they found a piece of ground that they actually felt was, was good farming ground. For a while, it was an idyllic existence. During the 1800s, as the war trackers progressed farther east, they came to the Kwasulu land. The Zulu nation actually felt that the fur trackers were uh, taking over grazing land. The Zulu were not about to share their territory with the Dutch settlers, and a series of vicious and bloody wars broke out between the Dutch, the Zulu, and the other colonial power in South Africa, the British. Sadly, what conquered the mighty Zulu was smallpox that the Europeans introduced. The natives had no defense for this disease, which was non-existent before Europeans mixed with them. Smallpox, along with rifles, decimated their villages. The colonists easily dominated the once mighty Zulu after that. Eventually, it was the British who would win control of the country. The Dutch who remained established their own orange free states or enclaves next to British and native territories and the era of racial segregation began. Apartheid, the practice of racial discrimination, was legal in South Africa until 1991. So Christine, the pointy you normally eat here with the roaster cake, right? Yes, we do all kinds of uh, accompaniments, but today we're making a roaster cook. When the food trackers was moving, uh -huh. they obviously didn't have a, always oh, have an oven. No beehives, no ovens around, and, yeah. But they still wanted their bread. So we make the bread and then we grill it, cook it on a grill. And roaster means grill. So it basically means a grill, grill cake. Grill bread. Yes. That's kind of... So I've got some flour here mm -hmm. and a bit of yeast. And then yep. I'm just going to add some salt. South Africans, we love our outdoor cooking. Um, so lots of the uh, traditions stayed with us and we're still using it today. Yeah, I was reading somewhere that nobody does more barbecues than you, <laughs> even more than the Australians. South Africans do like their brides, yeah, yes. Yeah. <laughs> it's nicely risen, it's nice and soft and puffy is what you want. Uh -huh. So now I'm just going to shape it and then we put it on the grill. So I'm just cutting nice chunks off here uh -huh. and shape it nicely to make individual roasted How you shape it? like? So we don't want to knead it again because we want it light and puffy. Uh, and any shape really doesn't really matter. So it's a, a rustic. It's a rustic acceptable? Cake. That's acceptable, yes. I we usually make it a square. <laughs> but <laughs> I want to make sure I don't get in trouble here. <laughs> so now we're going to uh, grill the cakes over a slow fire, cook through, but not burn on not the outside. Okay. You've got to have the right temperature, right? Otherwise it's going a to be burned outside. and and not uh, raw on the inside. Yes. So now this goes into the ostrich too, right? To the yes, idea. I think the meat is ready. Okay. So next we can cook the potatoes. All right, go ahead. Walter, could you please pass me the portobello? Absolutely, here you go. Thank you. What happens with the poiki is now we have the water, we've got the meat, potatoes needs to cook for a long time. So now we can move the fire uh, out a bit so that it's at the low temperature. Um, and what's very important with the poiki is you make layers. So later when you dish it out, you can actually see the different areas. Yes, Very because if you stir now, yep. then everything will fall apart. Once you serve it, you can actually see the different ingredients in it. And also it's often a, a cheap way to entertain a whole lot of people. Chicken will take two, three hours. 
Um, but the ostrich will take a bit longer, so five, six hours. So it's a very cooking. slow process. Slow so the flavor is yeah. fantastic. So time for you to catch up with your family and your friends. I know that every part of the world has some very unique specialty. The Bray? 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 <laughs> the, the Bray definitely has to be a South African. Absolutely. I heard that everybody has a very unique ways of making their marinades. Yes. For the for the kebabs, I mean, and yours really is intriguing. So these are Malaysian flavored spices, uh, and they came over with the slaves. They brought all their spices with them, and of course, obviously, the spice root. The Dutch people and the Afrikaners incorporated those spices into our food, into our culture. So what we do basically is we just take the turmeric, um, add it all to a pot, mm -hmm. and then uh, curry powder, ginger powder, brown sugar, and crush the star anise. And I'm just breaking the star on this for you to get a flavor out. You don't need to be really fine. No. So I'm going to add the rough chopped uh, onions. I want them rough because mm -hmm. I'm going to skewer them on the meat, on the skewer as well. Mm -hmm. And some nice fresh uh, bay hey. leaves. And some apricot jam. Thank you. So now that we have the spices and the apricot jam in there, we're going to add the, the vinegar and bring it to the boil. Stew it up? Yes, please. I don't know about you, sometimes you stew, sometimes you don't. <laughs> <laughs> what a great flavor, without even having been boiled. And the color. Yeah, um, unbelievable. Look at that. It just gives some, the flavors some time to develop and also for the meat to absorb all the flavors. And also the marinade, um, in the olden days, they didn't have refrigeration. Correct. So preserving this meat, uh, you could keep it for up to two weeks. Um, if it's not too hot, and that way they, they could keep their meat for uh, longer. So now I'm just going to add a simple cornstarch slurry. This has been marinated for how long? For two days. Oh, baby. That is beautiful. <laughs> a bit of sweet, a bit oh, of sour. Oh, yes, but all the flavors stay with it. Yes. I'm just going to skewer a piece of warthog, a piece of lamb, and then also a piece of onion adds extra flavor, and then I start again. Sometimes we even put some apricots on the skewer, Whatever you have, for you can add to for it. additional, for additional flavor. flavor. Uh -huh. You live here in this, what I call, uh, God's country down here. I mean, look at that. It doesn't get Absolutely any better. Beautiful. It doesn't get any better than that. Sun shining. Oh God! I mean, look at that. Look at look behind you. Look at what we have there. Just don't worry. Some female nyalas. <laughs> yeah. Tell me a little bit about uh, your family and how you all come down here and settled in this beautiful paradise. My personal family is very diverse. Um, my great grandfather came out from Ireland. On my mother's side, uh, we've got people from the French Huguenots, uh, also from the Dutch. You on, it. That's, on my why, that's why I like it. We have something common. <laughs> <laughs> Good. So now we have the skewers. Walter, would you start uh, putting them on the grill so that they can start brying? Um, and then I'll check on the, the poiki, see if it's ready, give it a nice stir, and then we're ready to eat. Can't wait to try this poiki. <laughs> I gave the poiki a stir, mm -hmm. so all the flavors are nice and uh, mm -hmm. developed now. And as you can see, we still have the potatoes and the carrots and the, and the beans, all whole pieces instead Lord. of just soft mush. In this paradise, eating this kind of food, you're fantastic. Nothing better than the outdoors. This day I will treasure forever, so I'm going to really thank you from the bottom of my heart because this was a fantastic, wild taste of history. Thank you.